thanks for coming. I think some of you have been here before. My name is Penny Wright. We've been very lucky over the last several years to know Marilyn Carminio, today's speaker. And she has come here, as you know, as some of you know, to talk about a wide variety of subjects. Um, Audrey Hepburn, Jackie Onassis, Princess Diana, the Roaring Twenties, uh, Baryshnikov, uh, Helen Mirren. That was a great one. She's actually working on one about Marilyn Monroe. She's working on one about women who were helped by the Italians to, to, to be hidden in World War II. Uh, right? Yeah. And actually last year, she came and talked about slavery and the American presidency. I think a couple of you were here. Anyway, so we're, I can't tell you how delighted we are to have a good association with her. Uh, as some of you know, she worked for many years at an international law firm where she presented client service training programs. She began her career, however, as a New York City school teacher and went on later to hold various positions at women's magazines, such as Cosmopolitan, where she worked for Helen Gurley Brown. Gee, that would be interesting. <laughs> and other magazines. Marilyn has lectured at many Long Island venues, and um, we are happy to have her here today to talk about the history of marriage. Please welcome Marilyn Herminio. I don't know if you're familiar with them. They're, they're these small animated lessons. I'm going to show you one in a minute. And it arrived in my inbox, and it was about the history and traditions of marriage. And I found it very interesting, so I decided to research it further. And I hope you will enjoy it uh, as much as I did. There's a lot of superstition, folklore, religious traditions. Um, and most of all, marriage initially was about survival. So here's the little TED talk, and I always like to say when I show these that they will tell you in four minutes what I'll then take an hour to explain. <laughs> from its main purpose, to the kinds of relationships it covers, to the rights and responsibilities involved, has varied greatly between different eras, cultures, and social classes. So let's take a quick look at the evolution of marriage. Pair bonding and raising children is as old as humanity itself. With the rise of sedentary agricultural societies about 10,000 years ago, marriage was also a way of securing rights to land and property by designating children born under certain circumstances as rightful heirs. As these societies became larger and more complex, marriage became not just a matter between individuals and families, but also an official institution governed by religious and civil authorities. And it was already well established by 2100 BC, when the earliest surviving written laws in the Mesopotamian Code of ur -Namu provided many specifics governing marriage, from punishments for adultery to the legal status of children born to slaves. Many ancient civilizations allowed some form of multiple simultaneous marriage, and even today, less than a quarter of the world's hundreds of different cultures prohibit it. But just because something was allowed doesn't mean it was always possible. Demographic realities, as well as the link between marriage and wealth, meant that even though rulers and elites in ancient Mesopotamia, Egypt, and Israel had multiple concubines and wives, most commoners could only afford one or two, tending towards monogamy in practice. In other places, the tables were turned, and a woman could have multiple husbands, as in the Himalayan mountains, where all brothers in a family marrying the same woman kept the small amount of fertile land from being constantly divided into new households. Marriages could vary not only in the number of people they involved, but the types of people as well. Although the names and laws for such arrangements may have differed, publicly recognized same-sex unions have popped up in various civilizations throughout history. Mesopotamian prayers included blessings for such couples, 
while Native American two-spirit individuals had relationships with both sexes. The first instances of such arrangements actually being called marriage come from Rome, where the emperors Nero and Elagabalus both married men in public ceremonies, with the practice being explicitly banned in 342 AD. But similar traditions survived well into the Christian era, such as adelphopoiesis, or brother-making in Orthodox churches, and even an actual marriage between two men recorded in 1061 at a small chapel in Spain. Nor was marriage even necessarily between two living people. Ghost marriages, where either the bride or groom were deceased, were conducted in China to continue family lineages or appease restless spirits. And some tribes in Sudan maintained similar practices. Despite all these differences, a lot of marriages throughout history did have one thing in common. With crucial matters like property and reproduction at stake, they were way too important to depend on young love. Especially among the upper classes, matches were often made by families or rulers. But even for commoners who had some degree of choice, the main concern was practicality. The modern idea of marriage as being mainly about love and companionship only emerged in the last couple of centuries. With industrialization, urbanization, and the growth of the middle class, more people became independent from large extended families and were able to support a new household on their own. Encouraged by new ideas from the Enlightenment, people began to focus on individual happiness and pursuits rather than familial duty or wealth and status, at least some of the time. And this focus on individual happiness soon led to other transformations, such as easing restrictions on divorce and more people marrying at a later age. So as we continue to debate the role and definition of marriage in the modern world, it might help to keep in mind that marriage has always been shaped by society, and as a society's structure, values, and goals change over time, its ideas of marriage will continue to change along with them. So what did we learn there? For most of history, love was not the basis of marriage. It evolved on political, economic, and social needs. Marriage has continued to evolve throughout history, reaching some dramatic changes in the last three decades of the 20th century. And it's difficult to define a standard or traditional model for marriage, even though we always speak about traditional marriage. And of course, the biological basis for love and marriage is reproduction. There is one uh, group, one society, uh, that has no tradition of marriage, and that's the Na people. They live at the foothills of the Himalayan mountains, and it's a society in which brothers and sisters continue to live together for their entire lives. And they can go out at night and have furtive meetings with whomever they choose, and the sisters will have children. Those children will be raised by the brothers and sisters in the family, with the biological father having almost no role. So, hunter-gatherer societies lived in small groups, about 10 to 12 adults and some children. They're regularly on the move, of course, searching for food, for nuts, for meat. And um, about, it, it always amazes me, 90% of our history was spent in hunter-gatherer groups. As a group, you needed someone, you needed the group to survive. No one could survive as an individual family. Um, you had to bond together for protection for all your needs. And in these societies, the most important person was actually the oldest woman because she had the most institutional knowledge about how things were done. And in biblical times, there was a bride price. So you may remember the story from the Old Testament of Jacob encountering Rachel. And he was, uh, many women of course were given in marriage by their father in exchange for a bride price. Jacob bought Rachel's hands with seven years of hard labor, after which he, does anyone remember what happened? Sister. He got the sister, absolutely. Uh, he, was, he was tricked there and he got Leah instead. Eventually he married Rachel, but I think Leah turned out to be the better wife. Is that how the story goes? Um, so it was possible that you didn't know your bridegroom until, until you met him and neither sexual attraction nor love was considered part of the deal. 
who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies, says the Old Testament. She works with her hands, she brings food, she rises before dawn, plants a vineyard, lays hands to the spindle, makes linen, she looketh way to the well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. So if you're a man and you're going to choose a wife, are you going to choose a pretty face or a strong arm? You're going to choose a strong arm. And as you heard there, polygamy is found in more places and times than any other form. Monogamy, only 5% of mammal species are monogamous. You heard there that monogamy was made into law in ancient Rome and Greece. Um, there are so many explanations as to why we became monogamous. To me, the most compelling is that if a man wanted his genetic line to continue, then it was in his best interest to stay close to the wife and the child to protect them from any dangers that would be out there. So marriage by capture, um, is, this is the lowest stage of barbarism, but it did exist. It was practiced in ancient cultures around the Mediterranean. And let's say a spurned suitor um, wanted to capture, wanted to uh, get the bride of his dreams, he would just capture her. Or if there weren't enough women in a given population, they would go out, raid their neighbors, and find someone. The bride would then be uh, hidden for about a month with the groom. This is one of the, rep uh, the representations in our history, the rape of the Sabine women. Rape really means capture in this case. But when Romulus and Ramus, who were the legendary founders of Rome, needed wives, there was nobody, so they tried to negotiate with their neighbors, the Sabine people, but they were unsuccessful. And when they were unsuccessful, marriage by capture was the result. And in Christian ceremonies, at least, the bride stands to the left. In a Jewish ceremony, um, she's standing to the right. But the reason that she stands to the left in Christian ceremonies is presumably the bride's family would be looking for her if she had been captured. And in case they show up, the groom has to have his right hand ready to pull his sword out. And your best man was really your best fighter when you went out to capture a bride. Your ushers, groomsmen, were really a small group of friends who would fight for you when you were going to get your bride. And uh, why was, is the bride carried over the threshold? It might be a remnant of marriage by capture in which the groom lifts her away and carries her off. Um, it could be evil spirits. Evil spirits are everywhere in the history of marriage, so he was lifting her up so the evil spirits wouldn't get her. Um, there is one other theory which is no longer relevant, and that's that she was too shy to cro cross the threshold. Yeah, that one's gone away. <laughs> so why does she wear a veil? Um, the, everyone used to dress in the same way. All the attendants would dress like the bride, and this is so if the bride's family comes looking for her, they can't tell who's who, and nor can the evil spirits. Um, that, so the bride would confuse both the family and the spirits. And as I mentioned, they hid away for about a month, and the expression honeymoon, which is consistent through languages, um, refers to this period in which they would drink a wine that was sweetened by honey, and they would be hiding away for one full phase of the moon honey. And um, I think this one is no longer widely practiced, but many people used to withhold the destination of their honeymoon, and that was kind of a relic. They thought it was bad luck. That was a relic. That's kind of a relic from the days of marriage by capture. If they know where I'm going, then they're going to find me. So in the ancient world, the lower classes are performing an economic function, and the, other, the upper classes are really the political function, the aristocracy. There's no middle class for a very long period of time, but it's still a matter of practicality as to who you will marry. So in ancient Egypt, about 4,000 years ago, in the Nile Valley, um, there were some, some um, states that were very powerful, and marriage was performed uh, really for alliances and uh, to establish dynasties. Peace treaties throughout history have often been sealed with a marriage. So no one cared whether the bride and groom thought it was acceptable, but uh, history had a greater calling. 
and rings. Um, back in ancient times, a groom used to tie around his bride's wrists and ankles, braided grass, and um, this was so that her spirit wouldn't leave her body. Um, the bands eventually evolved into leather, into stone, carved metal, um, and then gold and silver. And of course, something that is round is an eternal symbol. It has no beginning, no end. Well, in Greece, marriages were arranged by, arranged by the parents of the bride and groom. You didn't have much choice. And there was a dowry. Girls generally married very young, between 14 and 18. The men were older, in their 20s and 30s. The young age of the bride was thought to ensure purity. And for the wife to be fully accepted, she had to produce children. Greek men were very circumspect about their wives. They didn't talk about them a lot because they thought it might attract too much attention from other men. And they were mostly indoors. They had rather secondary status in Greece. The highest form of love was considered the uh, association of an older man as a mentor and tutor, and also as a sexual partner, with a younger man. So this is key. Aristotle says that citizens owe their loyalty to the state and not to themselves. And this is true for most of history. We're not going to get to individual happiness until the 17th and 18th centuries. And here's what Socrates had to say about marriage. By all means, marry. If you get a good wife, you'll be happy. If you get a bad one, you'll become a philosopher. <laughs> so why is it bad luck to see the bride before the wedding? Well, if your father had arranged a marriage for you and the groom sees you and doesn't like what he sees, he has time to uh, get out of the deal. So you didn't actually, it was considered bad luck for that reason. And diamonds. The popularity of diamonds comes from a superstition that the sparkle in the fire of the diamond uh, is the fire of love. The Romans believed that um, Cupid's bow, he shot diamonds out of his quiver. The Greeks believed that diamonds were the tears of the gods. There, was, there were also, um, obviously diamonds are, as an engagement gift are really, that's a, a modern phenomenon, but it does have a history. In 19th century England, a, pr a prospective groom would send his intended a pair of gloves, and if she wore them to church on Sunday, she had accepted. If she didn't wear them to church on Sunday, he would send her 12 pairs of gloves to hide the fact that she didn't have an engagement ring. And where does this expression, my other half, come from? There was a Greek superstition that said at one point we were all together and then we were separated into two. And when we look for a spouse, we're trying to be reunited with that half of us that was, was split apart at one time. So we're searching for our better half. In Rome, both parties had to agree. So it was a little bit more democratic, but alliances are still forged around politics and money. Divorce was so common, and it was done for some kind of political or social advantage. Uh, Cato, for example, divorced his first wife so that she could marry Hortensius for political advantage. And when Hortensius died, Cato remarried her. They wore white as a symbol of purity, but white was also the color that people wore on the important feast days. Now, um, ah, I didn't tell you about the braided grass that they used to, when I told you that they used to tie braided grass around the arms and the ankles. That's one explanation of the expression tying the knot. But there's a second one that happens in Rome because the bride used to be put into a corset with a lot of knots so, to, so as to frustrate the groom on the wedding night. And so that's the second reason people talk about tying the knot. And gentlemen, this is where stag parties originated. Roman women had more freedom, much more than Greek women. Um, men did rule over their families, but they were away a lot fighting wars. So women were managing household uh, activities. They could arrange their own affairs. Again, the central purpose was to have children. Beating a woman was grounds for divorce. It won't always be so, but it was in Rome. So giving the bride away, 
signifies, it goes back to ancient times, and it signifies the passing of authority from the father to the husband. Today, of course, many uh, parents, both of them will walk down the aisle, that is the Hebrew tradition, and um, when they say, who gives this woman, her, her mother and I do. So why do we get married in June? Why are so many marriages in June? It's because of the goddess of marriage and childbirth, Juno. The Romans were very superstitious. They used to cut open birds and read the auguries. And uh, May was a very unlucky month to get married. The end of June, because of Juno, was the most um, was the most popular. Now, as to the most lucky day and unlucky day, the luckiest day of the week was Sunday. Guess what the unluckiest was? Saturday. So that accounts for our divorce rate. <laughs> And the Romans signed all their contracts with a kiss, and that's why we kiss at the end of the ceremony. The wedding cake originally was a loaf of bread, and of course any kind of grain represents fertility. They would break the bread over the bride's head, and that would um, then the guests would partake in the, in the bread that was broken, and they shared in the good luck of the bride and groom. They didn't have flowers back in Rome. The brides would carry herbs under their veils, uh, particularly garlic, because that would ward away the evil spirits, possibly the groom. But uh, we didn't get flowers for a few centuries. Tossing rice, of course, another grain. This, this uh, began in Roman times, Roman and Egyptian times. And um, the groom was sure that the evil spirits were jealous of him, so this was very important. And it would, again, confuse them. So with all the divorce in Rome, I did find this very touching funeral oration um, from a gentleman who was married to a woman for a very long time. And he writes, marriages as long as ours are rare, ended by death and not broken by divorce. For we were fortunate enough to be together for 40 years without quarrel. Same-sex unions uh, existed also in Rome, uh, but never, never with a minor. Um, you can have a partner who was either a slave, a prostitute, an entertainer, but never a minor. And um, it was not legally sanctioned, but it was acceptable with no loss of status to the parties involved. And as you heard, uh, Nero actually, in addition to taking two men as his, his husbands, uh, and his reputation, as we know, is that he fiddled while Rome burned, he also had his mother and his wife killed. Um, he, he marries two men, and fortunately for the world, he commits suicide in June of 68. Emperor Augustus launched what was probably the first family values campaign, hoping to restore moral standards in Rome. So he's encouraging families to have more children, trying to discourage adultery, and he does that by rewarding people politically and financially. If you had more than three children, you would get a reward. If you had male children, you got another reward. Sons were especially valued. And um, I happen to like this one. If any man unmarried at 38 years old had to pay an additional tax. So maybe maybe they should consider that in our, in our tax legislation. But worse than that, you were barred from receiving an inheritance, and you couldn't attend the public games. So this is like saying, if you're not married by 38, you're not going to the Super Bowl. <laughs> and um, Emperor Constantine, his statue obviously is crumbling, and so did the Roman Empire around 312 AD, and that's when Christianity takes over in the marriage sphere, and they had very different ideas from the ancients. They um, <coughs> actually believed more in chastity than they did in marriage. They thought if people didn't continue to reproduce, the second coming would come sooner. <laughs> Um, no formal church services for, for the common peasantry. In medieval times, uh, the married couple becomes the basic unit of society. And the bride wore a blue dress. The blue dress was symbolic of the Virgin Mary's color, which is blue. But she would, if she didn't have a blue dress, she would tie a blue ribbon to her dress. And that's where we get something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue. Now, something old signifies the transfer of wisdom. Something new might be a dress. Blue um, in ancient Roman fidelity. And in 
the nobility, of course, these marital alliances are important in creating a ruling elite and obtaining power. The church now is taking on more quasi-governmental functions and became involved in the political uh, landscape of Europe. Noble we weddings were held in church because they wanted a paper trail that involved legitimacy and property rights. Prior mutual consent was good enough for most people, and you simply said to your intended, I, I take you as my husband or I take you as my wife. There was no paper trail, which of course later on led to some problems. For instance, if someone had been rejected, he might bring a lawsuit. And in the 17th century, the most popular reason for a prior consent lawsuit was brought by a man who had been rejected. So it became kind of a he said, she said situation. So eventually, all marriages had to be held in the church with proper documentation. And the uh, peasants, uh, married people, were really the basic unit of society, the pe peasants constituting the basic unit of production. Peasants did have wedding celebrations. Here's one. Um, they weren't as elaborate as the upper class. And here they are after a little bit too much ale. They were very raucous affairs. Um, they worked hard and so they deserved it. But the Lord um, for whom you worked, whose property you, you worked on, actually had a say in who you married. And so did your neighbors, because if you marry someone who's lazy, then everyone is going to lose out. It was a time where you, you really did need a village to, um, to, su to sustain yourself. So there's no disability, no health care insurance. So um, people needed each other, and your neighbors could actually shun you if they didn't like the person you selected. The wedding night. Um, the guests followed the bride and the groom to their room. Lots of obscene jokes. They put the couple to bed. Um, sometimes they witnessed the consummation. And the, they would grapple with the bride's gown, trying to get a piece of it for good luck. A bachelor would throw a stocking, and if he hit the bride's on, bride on the nose, he was the next to get married. So we finally, uh, they finally came up with the idea of flowers and a flower toss so that people didn't tear the bride's dress apart. They figured, well, if I can get some of the flowers and then they strew flowers down, down the aisle, then at least um, they won't be taking my dress apart. So the medieval wife did not really have it any better than the ancient wife. She has to milk the cows, make butter, care for the animals, clean and card the wool, brew the beer, carry water, ground grain at the mill, take products to the market, wash the clothes in the stream, and we have to add non-stop childbearing. During the Middle Ages, beating your wife was considered acceptable and encouraged. Remember in Rome, it was, uh, it was grounds for divorce. But there were laws protecting women. In London, there was a law that said you cannot beat your wife after 9 p.m. because it's too noisy and it disrupts your neighbors. Um, a henpecked man could be publicly ost ostracized, tied to a cart. Um, so it's only really in the last 200 years that women have begun to have protection from spousal abuse. There was a way out, though. Anybody know what it was if you didn't want to get married? Yeah. Absolutely. It was considered accept an acceptable alternative to marriage. And given that job description of the, uh, the middle of the medieval wife, I think this would have been a much better option. So how did we get to a sweet tiered cake? Remember it used to be a loaf of bread. Guests started bringing small cakes to the wedding and what they would do is stack one on top of the other and see if the bride and groom could kiss over the cakes they stacked. And again, everyone eats it, and it's good luck for all. During the Renaissance, wedding celebrations among the aristocracy become really big deals. They lasted days. They were really mega mergers, and they had theatrical events. They had floats. They had scenery. It was part of the entertainment for the, the people, the peasantry, and of course, the, uh, the guests. If you think you had a hard time picking your wedding menu, Eleanor of Aragon had to choose 56 courses. And then Henry comes along, and he wants a divorce from Catherine of Aragon so that he can marry Anne Boleyn. And of course, the Catholic Church did not permit divorce. 
Um, there are some abstract notions during this period, the 16th century, of love preceding marriage, but it's still very vague. Uh, the philosopher Montaigne said, any man who was in love with his wife was a man so dull that no one else could love him. So with Henry, of course, he, he uh, establishes the Church of England, gets his divorce. And then Martin Luther also uh, says that divorce is permissible under certain circumstances, adultery, a sexless marriage, or no children. So why do we tie, um, originally it used to be shoes, because the father would pass a pair of bride's shoes onto the groom, um, symbolizing the transfer um, of the woman from the father to the daughter. But why do we tie things on the back of the car? Well, it used to be that people threw things against the conveyance, the threw shoes, and if it hit the conveyance, then that was good luck for you. But of course, in today's society, you might hit someone and that will result in a lawsuit. So eventually, people started tying things to the back of the car. Aluminum cans became very popular because they made a lot of noise and they scared away evil spirits. Why do we have a bridal shower? There was one young woman in Holland in the 18th century who wanted to, she chose her own mate and her father didn't, didn't approve. So he said he wouldn't give her a dowry. And you couldn't really start a family without a dowry. It, it was, wasn't only money, it was things that you needed for the household, your sheets, your dishes. Um, so her friends got together and decided to shower her with gifts. And they gave her everything she would need. She would need. And that's how the custom of a shower began. Okay, so we are at the turning point, and this is the idea, a radical idea, that love precedes marriage. It doesn't come afterwards. The thought had always been, you know, if we fall in love after that, it'll be good enough. And it comes out of the Age of Enlightenment, all the new philosophical ideas. It's a break with thousands of years of tradition. People had more individual freedom to choose a partner. As you heard, they were better off financially so they could establish a separate household. And the wife is seen as the emotional support for the husband. She's not working beside him in the fields. Uh, wife beaters at this point could be shamed in village rituals. He who marries for love has good nights and bad days. It's a modern European saying. And in the 18th century, 19th century, Victorians developed this concept of sentimental love. This is the first time that romantic love becomes the basis of marrying. Uh, they felt that men and women had very different natures, that the, the woman was the moral influence on the family, purity was very important, and a good marriage was enough to satisfy every desire a woman had. They also believed that women lacked passion, only men had passions. But now marriage becomes the most important thing in a person's life. And all your hopes and dreams now depend on one person. Before, you had the whole community, so if you weren't too happy with your partner, there were plenty of other people around you. But now it becomes a little bit more loaded because all your expectations are, are your eggs are in one basket. And the home is seen as the sanctuary of domestic love. The wife is supported and protected by the husband. And now, contrary to Aristotle, who, who said that you owe your uh, allegiance to the community, not to, the, not to yourself, now it's reversed. And happiness, your personal happiness, comes before your obligation to the, the community. Um, family Sunday dinners and uh, holiday gatherings become very important. And uh, doing well for your family is more important than doing well for anyone else. The poor spinster. Uh, she used to spin the wool, of course, for the family. Jane Austen wrote to her niece, single women have a dreadful propensity for being poor, which is one very strong argument in favor of matrimony. And really, women did need marriage to survive. So I thought I'd take a look at the American West, because they had a shortage of women. Obviously, when young men went west, there weren't a lot of women out there in the wilderness. 
for them. And it was very interesting. Um, and as you can see, they had to advertise. Um, it was very common to advertise or to go through a matrimonial agency. So um, a lot of women actually did go west to marry. Many were single, they were widows, or they were people looking for some kind of excitement, some kind of a way out of the, the world that they were living in. And they agree to marry men who they don't know at all um, to gain financial security or again some kind of adventure. So here is an early matrimonial company and they advertise, we produce desirable partners for those matrimonially inclined. So this was um, the first OK Cupid, <laughs> except it wasn't online. Mm -hmm. How much are the rates? I know ah, the rates. Um, for Canada, oh, it goes by age. Under 30 years of age, 50. What does it say? 50 dollars between 30 and 45, 60 dollars. Candidates between 40 and 45 and 60. Of course, it gets harder. Uh, 75 and. Seriously, between 60 and $195? <laughs> I have a friend with a saying that uh, if, you, if you've had a very long marriage and your spouse dies, it's not the right time to look for another one. And what they say is um, going to the cemetery is on the way to the cemetery, it's too early to be looking. On the way back, it's too late. <laughs> but I actually knew some people who met at the cemetery. They were there uh, visiting the graves of their respective spouses, and they met enough times that eventually they started going out. Well, I love this, uh, this ad, wanted, good woman, must be able to cook, clean, sew, shovel horse stalls, must have horse and saddle, please send photo of horse and saddle. <laughs> But of course there was a lot of trickery, it's just like somebody who puts a, a fake photo online. And a judge put this ad in the newspaper. It said, do not be deceived by false hair, cosmetic paints, artificial bosoms, bolstered hips, and padded limbs. And it, I love this couple, I think they look so sweet. But oftentimes, people couldn't afford a new dress, so they wore their Sunday best, as this couple did. Well, there was a group in California in the 1850s who uh, decided that the happiest, the road to happiness was actually the bachelor life. And they met regularly to discuss the benefits. One gentleman decided that he wanted to send for a bride. So he sent for a mail order bride and he really wanted to marry her. He consequently uh, got pressured out of it by the club. She sues for breach of contract and she's awarded $2,000, which back then was considerable. But he still wants to marry her. So he goes ahead and he's married by the same judge who awarded his spouse the $2,000. And of course he was promptly dismissed from the California Bachelors Club. <laughs> and during um, the Belle Epoque, 19, maybe 1895 to the First World War, any of you who were Downton Abbey fans saw that there was a little um, relaxation in, in terms of women going out with a gentleman on a sporting without a chaperone. You may remember Lady Mary goes to a museum with a man who, and there's no chaperone. Um, and then, of course, the First World War really breaks down all the natural barriers that existed between men and women before the war because women are working as nurses on the field. They're coming into direct contact with men. Before the war, if you were waiting uh, for a train in Grand Central Station, men would have their waiting room, women would have theirs. And then the 1920s is the decade in which everything is overturned. It's the first sexual revolution. Uh, and people had lived through World War I. So many young men had been killed. And they want, just wanted to live for the day. And they wanted to overturn all the old mores, the traditions of the previous generation. A daring notion develops in the 1920s that women actually do have passion. And we had the rise of a new woman. Um, some of you may have seen, I've used this slide before, that's Barbara Stanwyck. We had women's suffrage, allowing women to vote. The 
The flapper is young, she's independent, she's bold, she's rebellious. They still wanted marriage, it was the ultimate goal, but they didn't want to be exactly like their mothers, although they had no blueprint for it. And there was still a real double standard existing between men and women. And it brought to an end, the end of the gentleman caller and the rise of dating. It used to be if a young woman admired a young man, she would tell her mother, the mother would call the young man's mother, they would arrange for a visit of the gentleman caller, the couple would sit in the parlor with the older generation in the next room. But with the rise of cars and telephones, a man can now call up a woman for a date. She accepts the date, goes out in the car. So dating comes out of the sphere of the family circle. And there's a new concept that sexual pleasure adds to marriage, and the male is the primary breadwinner. That changes a bit during the Great Depression because lives all over the world were seriously affected and couples were in constant stress over money. So more women entered the workforce but in lower paying jobs, not high status occupations. And this challenges certainly for men the idea that they're the single provider. Uh, caused some amount of conflict in marriages at the time. And uh, if you had both a husband and woman in a family working, you were considered to be double dippers. So that was not a good thing. You might uh, get a little flack from your friends for that. And of course, during World War II, when the soldiers go overseas, married women enter the workforce in greater numbers than previously before and in occupations previously held by men. And there is uh, Rosie the Riveter, that's the real one on the left, and that's the poster that most of us are familiar with. This is uh, a letter, ah, that's our, our most famous Rosie the Riveter, everybody knows who that is? It's Marilyn Monroe, Norma Jean Doherty, right. Um, so let me just read a letter before I get to the return of the GIs. This is a letter that a woman writes to her husband overseas. She says, darling, you are now the husband of a career woman. Just call me your little shipyard babe. Opening my little checking account too, and it's a grand and glorious feeling to write a check all your own and not to have to ask for one. So. Um, Many women were working outside the home before 1945, and then, of course, the GIs come home. And House Beautiful writes this, Your part is to fit his home to, his, hit to him, understanding why he wants it this way, forgetting your own preferences. And now we go back to the male uh, primary breadwinner, female homemaker of the 1920s that had been briefly disrupted during uh, the Depression and during the Second World the 1950s is the generation that we look to when we talk of traditional marriage. And um, this is the decade in which 90% of all people would be married. It's considered the all-important factor in your life. But again now, one person is responsible for your total happiness. 95% of all people would marry in this decade. And now people are living longer, so they're spending more time in a marriage. The average previously was 29 years in marriage, and by the 1940s, the 50s, excuse me, it had gone to 45 years. Many women went to college to get their MRS degree. Anybody remember that expression? <laughs> and here's a woman who says to her husband, I thought you said you would love me forever. And he says, I didn't think I'd live this long. <laughs> and so in the 50s, we're also, through advertising and television, we're, we're being given images of marriage as the, the perfect way to lead, lead, your, lead, lead your life, pardon me. And uh, of course, the nuclear family becomes all important. However, divorce rates are climbing, and sociologists Acknowledge that this is a byproduct of a love-based marriage. So, women still had economic and legal dependence on men. In the 50s, they couldn't take out a loan or a credit card without his co-signing. Many men felt burdened by being 
the sole provider, and many women felt frustrated in their role as exclusive housekeepers. One out of three people would divorce in the 1950s. But by, well, many more people married, too. Um, so by the 1960s, everything is changing. Um, we now have the second sexual revolution of the 20th century, and the birth rate, as you know, soared between 1946 and 1964, and this was a generation with very different ideas. More families were enjoying economic prosperity, there was more discretionary income, and a tremendous amount of social change. JFK elected president, the Cold War, the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Civil Rights Movement, the assassinations, the Vietnam War, the youth movement and sexual liberation, changing gender roles, protests, civil unrest, a man walks on the moon, and the decade ends with Woodstock. The pill became uh, very instrumental in, because it's the first time in history that people can really reliably control the size of their family and minimize risks of uh, out-of-wedlock sexual behavior. And now, increasingly, marriage is seen as a, marriage, as a union of two equals. In 1970s, you have the women's rights movements, you have gay rights coming up, no fault divorce. And being a homemaker is not entirely sufficient to keep many women happy. They wanted different options for their daughters, but at least at this time, they didn't envision lifelong work. This really was a watershed event. Um, when John and Yoko have a baby out of wedlock, <clears throat> this changes a lot. Um, pregnancy is no longer seen as a reason to get married. And of course, Roe versus Wade becomes law, so um, people can, can choose abortion. But um, I, I don't know about you, I now go to engagement parties where one of the, one of the people gets up and says, oh, we're pregnant. And in fact, we have that situation in my family. Uh, my cousin's son and his girlfriend of 10 years are expecting a baby. They are engaged, she has a ring, but of course my 96-year-old aunt would like them to get married first. And he said, oh, please, mom, let, let's just have the baby. Let's put first things first. Let's have the baby. <laughs> and so my aunt is still pretty with it. She's, we know the baby is a boy. And she said, I think they're waiting for him to grow up so he can be the best man. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the media now is showing us different images of women, not just the Ozzy and Harriet. Uh, the Mira Tyler Moore show was the first show to, uh, to <clears throat> portray a young single woman independent. Originally, the script called for her to be divorced, but they decided that the American public wouldn't take the two well today. And in the 1980s and 1990s, there's a lot, of, a lot of confusion and resentment on both sides because they are what they call situationships. Well, we're together, just chill, we'll have sex, uh, but we're not committed, uh, but we do have emotions for each other. So there is a lot of confusion. Cohabitation rises sevenfold from what it was in uh, the 1970s. And most people in their 20s will move in with a partner at least once in their lives before marrying. And now men are more likely not to want a subservient partner, but to want an equal partner. Divorce. Uh, the experts acknowledge that it is very hard to count. Scholars disagree. It had been at 50%. They believe now that it's more at 42%. People are marrying later when they're more mature, so um, marriages have uh, two more mature partners, and for that reason, the marriages that do succeed are, um, are reported to be very happy. So where are we today? Modern family, uh, blended families, gay families, tra traditional families. Um, marriage is no longer the primary way that we arrange our sex lives and that we view child rearing. The Supreme Court in June 2015, a 5-4 to four decision affirming gay marriage. Well, does anyone know what this is? You marry yourself. It's 
It's called salotomy. This is the weirder side of marriage. And uh, why? Uh, I don't quite understand it. You're married to yourself from the day you're born. But it originated in Japan. It's not legal. But in Japan, there are many more men than women. And so a lot of young women started to feel, I'll never have that big day. So they will have this ceremony. And everything proceeds just like a wedding. You're on a registry. You get your china, your silver. They, and there are agencies that um, will take you to Japan for the ceremony. Most of them are done, done there. And they arrange the whole thing. All well, the travel, if you want a standing room, you can have a standing room, all the arrangements for the reception. Um, so it's based on the question, if you were in a relationship with someone who treated you the way you treated yourself, would you choose to stay in the relationship? Unfortunately, I, I have no control over staying in this relationship with myself. I don't quite understand it. But it has been picked up in popular culture. When someone steals Carrie Bradshaw's Manolo Blahniks in Sex in the City, she decides to marry herself and on her registry is Manolo Blahnik. Sue Sylvester in Glee marries herself. She described it as a same self-marriage. Did you see it? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and actually Mark uh, Heath from the Jam TV series did I think we'll have enough time. I'm just going to show you the little um, the video because it's very funny. It's all tongue in cheek. Uh, we have Married by Mom on television. Uh, where's that little video? Here it is. It's very dry English humor. Oops, come on now. I didn't. I didn't. Let's see, here we go. Slide. Oh, here it is. I realised shortly after my 26th birthday that I wasn't going to get a wife. And um, I've messed up a couple of chances earlier in my life. So I decided um, I'd marry myself. I'd do it alone. I was declared as a marriage by the joint of Harry's and Matthew and receiving the ring. I therefore proclaim him husband. <laughs> It was, it was really lovely. It was, it was very nice. It was um, memorable. <laughs> Sometimes uh, I meet a, a, a woman or a, a young girl I, I find I get along with well, or I meet, go out sometimes, or meet them at work. And sometimes I think, oh, I, I could have married her. But um, I'm, I'm really very happy. <laughs> He's very happy. All right, hybristophilia gets worse. This is women who are attracted to high profile criminals. They call it the Bonnie and Clyde syndrome. They think I can change him. Maybe I'm going to get my 15 minutes of fame. One good thing is you always know where he is. <laughs> Ted Bundy allegedly received hundreds of love letters from women. Jeffrey Dahmer, the cannibal killer, um, received gifts, letters, money. And Scott Peterson, who murdered his pregnant wife, Lacey, uh, a sociopath, clearly, uh, got two marriage and this is the most famous, Charles Manson and Elaine Burton. She's 26. He was 80 at the time. And unfortunately, this uh, did not result in a marriage, although they were engaged. Elaine was hoping that when he died, she would get control of the body, and she would just tour around the country and charge people to see Manson's body, which, of course, is ridiculous because Charles Manson says he's immortal. So uh, the course of true love did not, did not run true in that on that occasion. All right, some people get their jollies. A lot of people spend time on the internet watching cat videos. Did you know this is a, a trend? I happen to like things, videos in which there are mistakes at weddings. I know it's cruel, but I do like it. So I'm going to show you my favorite one. Okay. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but we have to run it again. Oh shoot. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, so, what we're all these? That's why we have a happy and joyful wedding. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Yes. What do you predict for the future? Ah, that's such an interesting question because I read that 42% of children are now born out of wedlock. And millennials find it not always to their advantage to have contracts. More and more people are living together without the benefit of marriage. In Finland, there was an interesting article just the other day. In Finland, they said 67% of children are born out of wedlock, not necessarily for the same fathers. Of course, that's a very different, small, insular society. But um, I think option now, marriage is more optional for many people. I still get back to my mother's concern, though, is if people are randomly mating and they have children, how do you know that at some point you're not marrying your brother? We're going to have to have a registry. But yeah, it's more optional. It's very interesting. Millennials also, I had, I had a, a ring reset and I asked them, is it true that millennials are not buying diamond rings? No, they don't consider it important. They feel um, they'd rather have a trip, a nice honeymoon, or put a deposit on. They're not even buying houses as much. And they're not um, buying cars. If you're living in the city, people are doing Uber. So everything really is changing. And um, you know, maybe sometimes you get to such an extreme that people realize this isn't working either, and they go back to a, a older traditions. I don't know. It's it's kind of up in the air, isn't it? Yes. You mentioned the, the Mary Tyler. Tyler Moore show, mm -hmm. but there were a couple others in the 60s, right? Um, that girl. And yes, Julia, that was really Julia, the first. Yes. Julia. Julia, who was a nurse, right. Yes, there were. Mm -hmm. Julia was divorced, I believe, or widowed. She mm -hmm. had a child. Mm -hmm. And that girl, I mean, is still very much, she's half in the 1950s and half in the 1960s, but she is an independent career woman. All right, well, thank you so much for coming. It's been a pleasure as always. And um, well, I'll make it a few words. I just want to say thank you. What a delightful, interesting program. And as we may know, these are very time consuming to uh, research and assemble. And you do a really first rate job, Marilyn. We're thank always happy to have you here. And, by the way, uh, Joanna put some flyers for the next program that Marilyn will do, which is actually on Valentine's Day. Promises to be very interesting about Romeo and Juliet. So do come to, to that program as well. And thank you again, Marilyn. You're welcome. Really. Thank you.